thanks guys for coming today. Uh, they asked me to come up and teach the class for you guys, and I'm really excited about it, kind of nervous, but uh, we're going to be tying a few different stonefly patterns today. So uh, the first one we're going to tie is basically like a juiced up Pat's rubber legs type stonefly, but we're going to use a woven abdomen technique, use the Polish weaving technique to make the abdomen of the fly. So it's a pretty simple technique, it just kind of takes a little bit of patience. Uh, First thing I do is I use this uh, Moonlit ML04 or 54 hook. It's a nymph slash streamer hook, and I'm going to use it in a size 8. And I like to tie this pattern in a size 8 or a size 10. That's the thing. Um, I don't know if any of you guys really like those jig hooks, but I kind of do like the jig hooks. I like to fish the Euro nymph style. So what I'm going to do with this straight shank hook is I've got these beading pliers that I use. I have a round grip on them so they don't hurt the shank of the hook. But if I grip this hook, about right here and give it just a slight push. I've got one of those cool bent shank nymph hooks now and it gives the fly a little bit cooler profile. So before I even put my bead on, well I guess I can throw the bead on first. I want to tie in that first set of rubber legs as the antenna on the fly. So I'll leave the bead back at the bend of the hook <clears throat> and just dress my hook like I would any other bug. So Roscoe, you're on the team, right? The Moonlit team? Yeah. yeah, I am. What size bead is that? This is a 4.6 millimeter bead. Uh, okay, so when you do this pattern, I pick four little pieces of this rubber leg. It's the size medium centipede leg from Fish Tech. And when I tie these in, these kind of tend to be a bugger for people, but I watch Cheech on Fly Fish Food do a cool rubber leg technique. So what he does is he just pinches this thing right in the middle of the, the leg and holds onto the two ends and then you can just pull that up and set it right on the side of the shank of the hook where it'll stay put for you and I give that a couple of wraps and then I come back a couple of wraps so that I'm actually behind that tie-in point and then I can bring this guy back across and he'll stay put when I tie him into the other side. Russell, real quick, what's your last name again? Petrov. And then I can just kind of orient those little antenna towards the eye of the hook and then they'll stay put like that and then I actually just whip finish right here and take this off so that I can readjust that bead those legs like to get caught in the whip finisher but okay now we can seat that bead and just dress the hook like normal again You know what? I haven't had too much trouble with the moonlit hooks breaking. I have had a few of them that come in with like plating issues here and there, little stuff around the eye of the hook or an eye that's not closed. I fish a lot, almost 99% barbless hooks. And so I've used a lot of the fire hole hooks and I've used a lot of the moonlit hooks. And I, like, I like it, but I know a guy that breaks them all the time. See, I have, a, I have the opposite effect. I, I break more fire hole hooks than I do moonlit hooks fishing. Really? My, my Euro Nymph rig is a, I run a main line of like 15 pound fluorocarbon for my main running line. And so I pull snags out most of the time instead of like breaking them off. Right. And the moonlit hooks a lot of times will bend out and then I'll just take my hemostats and turn them back around and keep on fishing them. And they, cool. they, they work. I've got flies in my tr headliner in my truck that have been bent out 25 times in a day up in Big Cottonwood Canyon. So <laughs> if, if it keeps working, I just keep doing it. And I have had a bunch of fire hole hooks break right at the bend of the hook, like right, right where you tie in your yeah. tail or something that just break off right there but I think that comes with any hook company just tempering and batches and all that stuff is different but. okay so now that we've got the bead in place here we can move to the back of the hook and tie in our tail section which is just another one of those rubber leg guys and it's the same technique there pinch that to the middle pin it to the side Come back, turn that over the top. And then I like to try and just bury all of that little bit of rubber nub there just to make sure it's tied in nice and tight. And I like to cut these guys basically body length, so the shank of the hook length here, kind of trim those. Same for the antenna. It's a little oversized if you're trying to be anatomically correct for a stonefly, but 
I think the fish eat this just because those things wiggle. <laughs> I don't think it means anything other than that. Okay, uh, now we tie in a wire for a rib and just tie that completely parallel to the side of the hook shank facing you. This is a medium. This is its size medium, and this is actually a hot orange color. Once that's tied in, I just give that. And you don't have to worry too much about building bulk on the body of the fly. You can kind of get away with a few extra thread wraps and stuff because you are going to build a whole bunch of stuff onto the fly. Uh, after that rib is tied in and bound down, now I put a, I guess you'd call this a dorsal line of thin skin, and I do that with like an eighth inch wide strip, and I cut a tiny little triangle at the tip just so I have an easy tie-in point. And I tie that guy in right on top of those two rubber legs. And as soon as that's in, then you can kind of orient it so that everything sits straight. Also to mention, I started the fly with uh, 70 denier uh, UTC in, oh no, it's, uh, it's Danville's 70 denier. And I use that thread because I can bulk up the body of the fly and even out the underbody easier. And then once I switch over from the weave, I'll go back to a, the nano silk, which is like a GSP type thread. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so on the woven flies, usually pick two contrasting colors of thread so that you have that segmentation when you weave it up. And I always tie in the underneath side of the fly towards me and the opposite side is the darker colors or the top of the fly. Because most of the stone flies you see have a lighter underbelly. So I tie that in right up here where that bend is. That's gonna be where my thorax point is on the fly too. So I tie this in, just give it two wraps and let it hang. Set that guy back in my... Like, this is... Uh, DMC embroidery floss. It's just like the stuff oh, you buy over at uh, Joann's or the craft store. And once I've got that guy set, then I just rotate my vise just enough to tie in this other side. And then this is the part where you build in that body. So I usually come back about a third of the way with my thread and then roll these two tag ends over and then build that or bind that down rather and then trim off that waste. Now here is where I was talking about building up that body and building just a slight taper. And so I'm careful as I tie down those two pieces of embroidery floss to come back to that tying point, or the tie-in point, rather. And then I just spend a couple of seconds here just kind of reassessing everything and making sure that there aren't any lumps or any uh, dips or divots because all that stuff kind of translates into a really difficult weave. It's When you do the weaving thing, it's really important to make sure that underbody is smooth and flat and gives you the profile you want. Otherwise, it'll be hard. Your weave will tip around and move around and it'll be real bad. And then you do want just a slight bit of taper, but not too much. And when you feel like that's about right, then I usually go back uh, after I whip finish this, because you have to get this out of the way so that you can do the weaving technique. And this will be where I end with the 70 denier thread. So whip finish that guy and tie it off. And then I, towards, towards the, the tail, so that the, the so it's the smaller at the bend of the hook, and then just barely gradually. And so then what I'll come back and do is I'll take these flat hemostats that I have, and I crush this thread so that I can actually force it to be a flat profile. And then I can turn it to the side, and I can kind of tune up that shape too, so that I get the shape that I want in that body. And it does help a lot just to make it flat, even if your body's a little bit wonky. Okay, this is where we're going to turn the vise, Todd. This is the hard part. It's actually the hardest part I is know, just keeping the tension on your thread. If you, if you can keep constant tension on the thread, then it goes pretty quick and pretty easy. So you always start with the lighter color, which is the underneath color, and keep them basically committed. The one's going to be the underneath, and the one's going to be the top. So all that you do for the weave is bring the underneath to this side, 
bring it up and cross it, and then bring the other one across the top. So then this one stays back underneath the bottom again, and then they just you just alternate. So as you cross, you stay on top. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so see, each of those weave finishes creates that little segment. Do you, do you pull them tight as you're weaving? Tight-ish. You don't want to pull too tight because what then will happen is the thread itself will compress so tight that mm -hmm. it kind of looks crappy. You kind of want to try and keep <clears throat> it just steadily tight. And you want to mm -hmm. try and also keep these fibers of the, of the floss flat as you can. They'll mm -hmm. tie in and seat better if they're flat. <laughs> Is that embroidered thread a silk? No, silk is hard as hell to weave with. <laughs> oh, that is you, so you can't, slick. You can you do it, but it's really, really easy. Yeah, this yeah, is Walmart yeah. or Joanne yeah. or any yeah. of those Michael's, places. Sure. Michael's, any of those Hobby places. Lobby. Yeah. See, then when you get up here to that end of that thorax <laughs> point where we tied in the, or where the bend in the hook is, then you have to just pinch that tight with your finger. And then we can go back to this this view and you guys can see what's going on again. <clears throat> then take these things and just pull them down straight and tight and that's when I get back to the nano silk and I do this because this is a really kind of bulky material and I want to be able to make sure it's bound down real tight. Is that a 12 or 8? This is the 18 aught so it's 30 denier. You know I cut my biots last week with that stuff. Yeah you can you can do some really neat tricks with elk hair too when you're doing caddis patterns cut, and cut stuff and you just slice it right off yeah. <laughs> so then I go two or three wraps in front of that little bundle of thread and then I go right back beneath it oh no and then once that's tied in I'm gonna re adjust yeah. my hook there. Okay so once those are captured on the side and in front with a couple anchor wraps then I will just continue that until I can pull it back to that same point. Wow. I, I can do my wife's French braid now. <laughs> <laughs> if you can do this to your daughter's hair, you're going to win big brownie points. Huh? <laughs> That's really cool looking. Okay, so you now... that over so we can see the Yeah, absolutely. Side. So then you see the underneath side? Yeah. Oh my goodness. That is it's like a real bug. It turns into a very, very believable bug. <laughs> And it, that segmentation is pretty awesome. Okay, so now that that's all bound down, it's bring that thin skin piece across for that dorsal section. So you got that modeling and that kind of fun look there. And I'll do that, come up to where I can wrap it over itself. You're still with the nano. Oh, yeah. The okay, and then I now that that's tied in, it's just uh, running the rib. But with this uh, Polish rib, Sorry. You kind of have to pay attention which way your first wrap goes because that's going to dictate which way you rib the fly. The way that I do it with my left hand going underneath each time, it's a counter rib. So I'm going to wrap towards myself. So you're countering. Yeah. So I'm going to come back like this and go one time right around the base of those little biot tails. And then on this one is where I start to step up and you can put that rib right between each of those knuckles on the weave to kind of accentuate that segmentation there. And that weave gives you the space. Yep, so it's, it's all a perfectly segmented body every time. really tight. Right in the black. And then I just couple in front, couple That's behind. Awesome. And then I like to pinch oh, that right wire there. right there. It and get just trim it off with the flush cut place. wires. Yeah. Where in the world did you get those? These are also at the Hobby Lobby. These little flush cut guys are awesome for everything from like articulation wire and trigger oh, yeah. wire yeah. it's they're the only way to go what are they called they're just flesh cut pliers flesh cut yeah you pliers. can get well, right uh, jewelry pliers yeah exactly oh, yep. I see. Yeah. All they're like three, three to five dollars at almost really anywhere they're, and they're terrible. awesome for that kind of stuff why what ruin your scissors right exactly okay so now we've got the body we've got antennas and we've got tails we need to do legs and we need to do a wing case so on the, way, on the legs, it's super simple, one knot. And this is going to be the back leg and the front leg. So do both of them, get them ready. Do a knot in each one. So why the knot? Just to give it kind of that kinked leg. Like See a, this right here? Oh, he's got it kinked. It just kind of gives it a little bit more life. You know how they have those little... I like to tie this pattern, I like to tie stoneflies a lot with biot tail or biot legs and stuff and it kind of gives a little bit life, more lifelike. You look. put a knot in those too? 
Oh, hell no. Yeah, I was gonna say. I've tried knotting I've bias a couple times, those, and even but... if you can manage it, they don't look that awesome. They kind of get mangled or whatever. Uh, yeah. So I want to put a little mm -hmm. bit of dubbing on there just to kind of even out this thorax section, so that when I do tie in stuff, it doesn't crisscross and go crazy. And I'm going to do just a tiny little bit of a, I won't do the dubbing loop, but just this uh, remix dubbing. It's basically squirrel dubbing is all it is. Okay. Squirrel, I believe it's squirrel on a mix of a little bit of a hairs. Oh, I notice they've got waxed panel thread now. The, they've got a waxed thread. It's a more, it's more like a pre-waxed UTC than, a oh. na, than nano silk. It's not, so it's, it's not, not it's not the silk. It's not both. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. But it is kind of cool stuff. If you're, I mean, if you're tying like lots of soft tackles and little things like that, it's going to be real good for that. There's hardly anything there. What's that? The wire is red. The wire on this is hot orange, I hot think. Orange. Hot orange. Yeah, and it's the uh, ultra wire right there. Okay. What did you do to improve your dubbing technique? I listened to a guy a couple of years ago that basically said every time you put dubbing on your thread, take off like two thirds of it. <laughs> Don't put just don't just go, just go light as you can and just build it up. Yeah, because it it can really mess up the way of a, fl a fly looks. Okay, so now to tie these legs in, you take that little kink section, kind of like a hopper leg there, and just pinch wrap it. Just gauge the length, hold it in place with your thumb. Oh, that's how. And then tie that in. So then you see that guy's just nice and tight. And then we'll we'll brace that out with a little bit of dubbing between the wing case, and you'll see. Then we rotate it across. Or rotate it around and do that other same thing on the other side. And these, this pinch wrap is the key to like so many things in tying to make it so much easier for yourself. And just gauge that, and just hold that rubber leg right in place so it doesn't go anywhere. And then once it's done, or once it's in place, you can adjust it slightly with a little bit of a stretch. So you're one of those kids they call naturals. Well, <laughs> uh, maybe I don't know about that. <laughs> That's a compliment. <laughs> wow. I'm going to go ahead and give that a little ball of dubbing now to separate those two groups of legs just so that you can so they have the action that you want in the water anyway, so they don't foul on themselves. Is anybody fishing today? I forgot my pole. <laughs> you did yesterday? And you said you hit the middle? Yeah. And it was a snowbank hellhole? Yeah. Lots of fish. You get into a midge hatch. 100 feet up the river it was a chlorine hatch, and then 100 feet down the river it was black gnats that come out. Probably buffalo. Yeah. The buffalo year. midges, yeah. yeah. That's good to hear. You should hear <coughs> Mickey's speech on buffalo yeah. midges. <laughs> Did he have a speech on buffalo? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Uh, there's no such thing. Really? Yeah. They're gnats. They're gnats. Okay. I, you were right. They were <laughs> I can't. I can't. Me. I gotta look. I, if I can find some photos. Of I was just gonna say. I swear I've seen some photos. Okay. Now that those guys are cooperating slightly, those legs always like to go where they want to go anyway. But okay. So those guys are there. I trim these all off to the same length, which is, like I said, a little bit obscene for a natural stonefly, but. Pretty great for a wiggly trout snack. <laughs> and all that the wing case is is a little piece of thin skin. And I use a darker color for that just for those little wing pads. And all I do to make that is just cut a, like a quarter inch wide strip. And then I take these little the hole punch and I just nip the very back edge to give it that little profile. Oh, cool. And then just, then just cut off a little triangle. Oh, I gotta find more crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then I like to get some wax on my thread when I'm dealing with the thin skin because it likes to slide around a little bit when it's tying this guy in. And it's the same thing again, just set it where you want it. Pin that in. 
and you can kind of just whip this nano silk if you wiggle it like that did you see how the tip of that triangle just disappeared right yeah. into the bead yeah yeah so then all you got to do is bind that little guy down with a couple of turns of thread whether i actually saw it or not is it, it just <laughs> it, it, once you get that little tr triangle in there it against the bead it. well no it didn't cut it it just uh, if you just slightly pull it just tucks that little tag in it'll flip in and under it'll cut it flips in i think it can if you're not careful but, but biots yeah man, they just go. and then it's just a simple <clears throat> whip finish to finish the fly just one wing case i just do the one wing case yeah. i i've done a few of them with multiples but it, this is definitely like an impressionistic kind of thing where yeah. it's just kind of wanting to be it's well, well try, the tribe don't he's count. not going to see it yeah if they can count i'm screwed already <laughs> so there yeah this one i liked i told some guy the other day he was like because i posted this on my facebook page and somebody's like well you know trout can count and i was like well i tie him with four legs so that i had insult to the injury when i stick this in their face <laughs> oh man that did only have four legs i'm an idiot <laughs> <laughs>